uh, to the thematic program on stochastic modeling. Uh, I'm Victor Araman from the Alliance School of Business. And as you know, we're finishing with the first theme uh, today on uh, uh, revenue management and dynamic pricing with a seminar. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to have with us Omar Besbes from Columbia University to actually give us a seminar on data-driven pricing. Um, Omar is a is a is a great friend, and you know we you know our relation date back to to so many years now. Omar is the Vikram Pandit Professor of Business at Columbia University, where he's a member of the Decision Risk and Operations Division in the Graduate School of Business. He's also a member of the Data Science Institute and the Research Director of the Deming Center. His primary research interests are in the area of data driven decision making, with a focus on applications in e-commerce, pricing and revenue management, online advertising operations management, and general service system. His research has been recognized by multiple prizes, including the 2019 Frederick Lancaster Prize, the 17 MSOM Society Young Scholar Prize, the 2013 MSOM Best Paper Award, and the 2012 Informs Revenue Management and Pricing Section Prize. He serves on the editorial boards of Management Science and OR, and he has taught over the years core MBA courses in OM and Business Analytics, in MBA elective on Advanced Business Analytics, as well as various PhD seminars on stochastic models. We need to add this one as well, revenue management and <laughs> data um, driven decision making. He's a recipient of the Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence in the core uh, at Columbia Business School. Omar is a graduate of Ecole Polytechnique in France, received his MS from Stanford and 2000, a PhD from Columbia University, uh, sorry, uh, Stanford in 2000, and a PhD from Columbia in, in 2008. Before joining Columbia, he was on the faculty at the Wharton School University in, at Pennsylvania. So uh, welcome, Omar, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victor, for this very generous and kind introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. I mean, it's a great pleasure to speak and to be part of, of this program. Thank you for everyone for organizing and putting it together this amazing, you know, essentially workshop over multiple months. And so you know, I'm really excited to be here today. And I'm also really excited about the topic of today, which is namely pricing, but also the concept of data-driven pricing, right? So the talk that I'm going to present today is based, you know, is not my own making. It's actually based on joint work with two extremely bright former students and current students, Amin Anwer, who's currently at Facebook Core Data Science, and Ashraf Bahamu, who's a PhD student in the IUR department. And all of this work would not have been possible without you know, their, you know, their work, right? So um, now, you know, this talk will be a bit broad and particular, you know, when I was thinking about the title, there were two titles that I could have picked. One is data-driven pricing, which is really capturing what we're gonna do, but another could be based on the insights we're gonna derive. In particular, another possible title we could have had for this talk would have been on the surprising value of your data, right? I hope that by the end of this talk, you will try to think a bit differently about how valuable your data is and the trade-offs between data sizes and types of performances that you can achieve, right? And what I wanna do before I get started is really to encourage everyone to ask questions along the way, right? You can you know, unmute yourself, I think the size will be about 60 individuals or so, so do not hesitate to unmute yourself, ask a question. I'll try to make pauses here and there, but really I want this to be as interactive as possible, right? This is not just meant to be a one way. This is a workshop to facilitate also ideas exchanges. So do not hesitate to interrupt at any time with any questions, yeah? Okay, so what will be the... Uh, the overview of where we're going to head, right? So I'm going to first give a very broad introduction about pricing, in particular, the need for data-driven pricing and why this need arises and the types of challenges that this uh, leads to. Then with this general, I would say, motivation in mind, right, we're going to formulate a very general mathematical program that would allow us to think very generally about data-driven pricing problems. And then, you know, when we're speaking about data, we're going to look at different types of common data structures that emerge in practice. Some of these data structures will be what I will call transaction data, right, where we observe during what we have sold and at what price we have sold things in the past. And another would be what I would call data that is more aligned with market research. If we are interviewing different customers and getting an understanding of how they value our particular product, 
trying to think about how can we leverage this other type of data, right? And we're going to actually formulate the problem that will, will that will encompass these different types of very common data structures. And finally, we'll conclude with some takeaways and ideally discussion. And again, do not hesitate to stop me at any time. We want to have as much discussion as possible. All right. So let us first start with an introduction. Right. So if you think about pricing, you know, and I think after. You know, for those of you who attended Renee's lectures, right? So we've seen that pricing is very common and central across industries. Pricing is one of the main levers that you have at your disposals to affect revenues, right? We're seeing pricing being updated, you know, essentially on a day-to-day -day basis in retail, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis in hospitality or in transportation, right? The Uber pricing are changing by the minute as a function of the underlying supply and demand imbalances, but also as a function of how customers value the particular service, right? If it's raining outside like in Beirut today, or if it's not raining like in New York today, maybe customers would value the service differently, right? So what is the core at the heart of pricing? A core concept, right? Is to try to understand how do customers value the product or the service that we deliver? Right? And this is typically captured by what we call a willingness to pay distribution. Right? So it's possible that Yuri or Dana in the audience would value differently a product, right? And everyone would have a different willingness to pay distribution for the product, right? But understanding the heterogeneity in customers is very important to pricing. As a matter of fact, any pricing algorithm would have that as an underlying input to try to assess how to price. Right, what's the key trade-off of pricing? Right, we would like to balance between the volume that we can get and the margin that we can get per transaction. Right, if the population was homogeneous and valued the product in exactly the same way, then pricing would be easier. We just need to take, find that point, that price at which I can get everyone to buy, right, and still maximize my revenues. Right, but in general, the population is heterogeneous. And two customers or 10 customers would value the, the, price, the product differently. And then there's a trade-off. As I start increasing my price, yes, I increase my margin, but I'm also getting a lower volume of customers who are willing to pay at that particular price. And now it becomes critical to really understand the nature of this willingness to pay distribution and this underlying heterogeneity. Right, so that at a high, at a high level, the challenge of pricing. Now, if you go back to the basics and you ask, okay, how do I price in practice? The truth is that, okay, if you want to apply this, there's never any willingness to pay distribution that's given to us, right? This is a theoretical construct. This is a textbook way of doing pricing, but what's available to us in practice, we only have access to potentially actually quite limited data, right? And as a result, the question in practice is not how to go from willingness to pay to pricing, but rather, how to go from data to pricing decisions, right? And it is on this challenge that we're gonna focus on today, right? So at a high level, we're gonna think about, you know, some historical data that we've collected so far, right? Call it script age. And now this historical data could take different forms, right? One example of such data could be sales data. We observe past prices that we have post over every quarter in the past years, and for example, the associated conversion rate on our website, right? That would be an example of historical data, right? Another example of historical data could be market research. Maybe I've actually gone and interviewed different customers and tried to assess how do they value the products that we're offering, right? This would give me essentially samples from the willingness to pay distribution, right? And other examples of data that you could have is how do users interact with our websites? How long do they spend on the products? What type of intent can we infer from their behavior on our website? Or potentially also, what are our competitors doing? Right? All of these would be useful inputs in terms of trying to, and that we could collect as historical data. Now, what's the challenge? Ideally, what we would like to do is to go from such historical data to an optimal decision or a good decision in terms of pricing, right? So what, how are we gonna think about the pricing policy 
a data-driven pricing policy is going to be a mapping from historical data to a pricing decision. Right, and we're going to think about that very generally. In particular, it may not be just a posted price. It could also be a randomized price. We're going to allow for deterministic prices or distribution of prices. So the mapping is essentially mapping from history to possible prices that we could post. Right, and I want to emphasize here that you know this is first of all a very important practical challenge because really this is the actual challenge. How can we best leverage the data that we have to develop? you know, to get good pricing decisions. What are good heuristics to transform data into decisions? That's really the challenge of data-driven pricing. But from a theoretical perspective, there are also fundamental questions that emerge here in terms of what is the robust value of information? To what extent is particular information systematically valuable, right? Independently of the underlying distribution that we face, right? And we're gonna see how we're gonna be able to answer, you know, questions, on the practical front, but also on the theoretical front. Right, so let us look a little bit about what happens with transaction data, just to get some intuition here, right? So, you know, sales data, you could think about it as being past posted prices, right? So a website had had different posted prices in the past, say for a camera, and then there was a conversion rate. We observed that at the price of $20, customers bought, you know, 20% of the customers bought. At the price of 30, maybe 10% of the customers bought. Right here, when you have sales data, there's an important subtlety to recognize, right? In terms of this type of data structure is that the past decisions affect what we observe, right? So we don't observe exactly how customers value a product. The data that we have just leads to observe that actually at a particular price, there's a fraction of customers that is willing to buy, right? So we only observe that. So there's some heavy censoring actually happening in the data when we have only transaction data, right? So, you know, and, and, and the censoring is, is challenging, right? In particular, if, you know, you have offline data, you've collected past prices and conversion rates. The truth is that there's no systematic way to understand how would information accumulate over time. It's not clear that you have explored enough prices in the past to be able to price accordingly, right? Because data is censored. Suppose that, for example, in the extreme case, you've only priced at a single level in the past. What could you say for the future? Is this any useful information that is associated with just having one single price in your historical data? Right? And, uh, and often, you know, given this challenge and this lack of systematic way of understanding the value of historical data, one can also think about now, given that we don't have the data, how should we collect the data, right? And this has, you know, there's a lot of work in this online data where we indirectly construct an appropriate data set over time that allows us to essentially learn the true or the optimal decision over time. Omar, right, and, yes. Uh, sorry, just a question. Um, do you assume anything about the population of customer? Do you assume that you know at least the size? I mean, or more? Very good. So, so I'm going to come to what we assume exactly, right? So here, I'm, go I'm going to come in a moment. So maybe I can postpone here, but we're going to assume fairly limited. You know, the assumptions would be very limited. Actually, the problem formulation will be very short, but I'll clarify exactly what we assume. Yes, yeah. The yeah. other questions are clarifications at this stage. Right, so, so just to highlight here, when you have transaction data, there's, if you're in an online framework, you have an exploration exploitation trade-off there that emerges. And usually one way to measure performance is in a regret fashion to try to say, as I have many opportunities to learn, how, at what frequency should I be experimenting? Right, I'm not gonna go into the detail of that because I'll talk, we'll, we'll not be focusing on that, but one thing that I wanna highlight here is that the key feature of good policies in this in an online setting is that they maintain price dispersion right similarly a good feature of any good estimation you know exercise in econometric is to ensure that there's price dispersion to be able to ensure that we have a price elasticity estimates and optimize prices as a function of that right essentially getting an understanding of the underlying derivatives of the revenue function is critical to 
right? And, and usually performance is measured as, you know, a function of the best growth rate of regret, right? Which is at how, at what rate does regret grow over time? Right, and this is in line with, for example, what is done in multi-arm bandit problems, except that now there's underlying structure that can be optimized. So here, what we're gonna do is that we're not gonna optimize the data that we have, but we're gonna ask a more basic question, which is what can we do given that the data that we have? In particular, I'm gonna argue later that actually many common data sets have very limited price dispersion, if any. Right, prices are not necessarily changed systematically. And when you have this historical data, one question is, can you do anything given such data? How informative are data sets without price dispersions? Can you price without derivatives? Is there anything that can be said there? Right, and, and we'll come to that. Now, this is one type of data structure we'll focus on. The second type of data structure is samples from the willingness to pay distribution. Right, suppose that I interviewed Marco, Yuri, Victor, Dana, and I collected four samples of how much would they value this particular watch, right? And everyone would tell me $50, $60, $100, or maybe $5, right? And now, given these samples, if I've introduced three customers or five customers, can I price based on such information? How valuable are such samples? Right, and this is a classical question. And in particular, a classical way of approaching this question has been to ask, how many samples do I need to be within epsilon of the optimal performance that I could achieve if I knew the full distribution of the population? Right, and this is, you know, a, 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 and one way to quantify this is to try to characterize the order of magnitude of the number of samples needed, which would typically be expressed as one over the accuracy we'd like to the power of gamma, and then optimize that power gamma. Yeah. And this is what, what, what we mean by asymptotic optimality. Now, now, and here the best gamma is typically driven by these local properties of the revenue functions, right? So it's really a local argument, right? And here we're gonna deviate from these local analysis because we're gonna be interested in settings where we don't necessarily have a lot of information. When we don't necessarily have a lot of information, we should not only quantify small pricing mistakes, but all kinds of pricing mistakes we can do, right? And we're gonna to try to build a bottom-up approach to data-driven pricing, right? And just to highlight here what is known and what is not known in these settings, where uh, we have the sample, we have samples of the willingness to pay distributions. And again, here I'm going to specify later the underlying assumptions. But here, at a high level, what is reasonably well understood is sample complexity results. What happens when we have a lot of data, right? And once we have a lot of data, how much data do we need in order to be within epsilon? When epsilon goes to zero, we have an understanding of how much data do we need. Right, if we want to be close to the best price we would have taken had we known the true distribution. Now, outside of this, the truth is that there was very little that was known. As a matter of fact, there's one result that, that actually results that one result that is quite surprising, actually, that was known before is that actually, if I only interviewed Victor and asked Victor, how would you value this watch? And Victor gave me the, his value. Now, just based on this sample, one can say something meaningful. I, even just based on one customer, actually one can say something meaningful. Based on two customers, there was a result as well, right? And I'm, com I'm gonna comment on these later. But it's already quite striking that just based on very few samples, something can be said that is highly non-trivial with regard to how well we could price. But what I wanna highlight outside of these two points here, essentially, we don't know much. Right, and, and I would argue that essentially all the practical data sizes fall somewhere in between. Right, and now what are the types of questions one would be interested in here? Some is, what is the best performance I can hope for? These would be impossibility results, but also what can I achieve? How fast do I accumulate information as I interview more and more customers? 
Right, and here what I highlight is when I say I interview more and more customers, we're not going to look at going from 10,000 to 20,000. We're going to look at going from one to two, two to three, two to 10, right? And trying to see what is this transient of learning? How fast are we learning? And how fast is information accumulated? Right, so in particular, this is, you know, interesting from a theoretical perspective, and you will see it's quite actually fascinating from a mathematical perspective. But it's also interesting from a practical perspective in terms of understanding how should we size our market research? Do we need to interview 5,000 customers or are 10 customers enough? Or maybe 30, right? And, and, and we'll come to that, right? So now just at a high level, what I would argue is that- So Omar, sorry, just a quick question. Is that yes. okay? No, it's yeah, just a very quick one. Is We're talking here more like a, a sequential sampling or just a fixed sample that you decide from the beginning? Okay, very good. So, so here we're, we're speaking about the fixed sample that you have from the beginning, offline data. But the truth is that in this setting, because it's samples, there's no censoring. So the decisions don't affect what we observe. So we could also think about it as a sequential setting, right? However, for the transaction data, we're going to focus on an offline setting. Offline. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions or clarifications? Okay, so, so what I, I would argue is that, you know, there's a reasonable understanding of the performance of learning algorithms when we, we have a lot of time to learn or we have a lot of data, right? If you have samples, there's a need of sufficient number of representative examples. If you have conversion rates, you need to have sufficient price dispersion over time to learn appropriately, right? You need a lot of information at different price points. Right, but what there is a very limited understanding of and what this talk will focus on is how are we getting to this good performance? How fast are we getting to this good performance? This is what one could call the transient behavior of learning, right? How fast are we learning as we accumulate data and what type of robust statement can we make with regard to this transient of learning? Right, and, uh, and so, Again, there are two motivations for this. One is purely theoretical, which is to try to develop a bottom-up approach to data-driven decision-making that leads to an understanding of the true or exact informational content of the data we have at any point in time, right? Really even small, little data, how valuable it is, right? And that could inform also online decision-making, but already in the offline setting, there is very limited understanding of that. But there's also a very practical motivation for this. If we start thinking about how to price, right? And we start asking ourselves, oh, but if the environment is non-stationary, you know, information from a year ago would not be relevant. Information from six months ago might not be relevant. So maybe the only information that's relevant is those over the past three months. Now, over the past three months, maybe I didn't have any price dispersion, right? Maybe I've been using only a single price. Right. If I'm trying to introduce a new product, I would have very limited information. If I have constraints on price changing, price changing because customers are not do not receive very positively price changes, then again, I would have very limited price dispersion. Right. So in general, I would argue that limited data is more the norm than the exception. Right. And the practical data says falls exactly in the regime where you know there is actually at least. I have a, a very big gap of understanding how well can we do in these data set sizes, right? And we're gonna try to try to see what, you know, make some progress on that and, and see what are, what are other questions that this leads to, right? So again, there's a broad literature on this topic and there's a broad literature across communities, right? And here I'm just highlighting a very limited sample of these there's literature around pricing without any information. There's literature around pricing while learning. And there's literature around some small sample regimes. There's literature in operations research, in computer science, and in economics on these topics, right? So I will refer to exact studies a bit later when we make you know, uh, more detailed comparisons. Yeah. So, so let us now start with you know, anchor the formulation and lay out all of the assumptions that are made here, right? So uh, 
Before I go into the formulation, any questions or high level questions before we delve into the details of the formulation? No? Okay. So let us um, try to, I promise that the formulation would be short, Marco. So what is the formulation, right? So we have a seller who's trying to sell one indivisible good to the next buyer that comes, right? And uh, the buyer has a value distribution F with support in zero infinity, right? There's no assumption on the support here. And what's the challenge here? The seller does not know the distribution F Right, so there's no, we don't know the actual distribution F, but we have observed some data, script F, that could be, that is associated with F, right? In particular, for example, we have observed samples that are drawn according to the distribution F to the population. We have observed conversion rate, which would be, you know, essentially percentiles associated with the distribution F. These are how we're gonna convert the earlier conver uh, information structures to this formulation. Right, but now we're going to think about it as an abstract level. There's history H that is associated with the underlying unknown distribution F. And here we're going to consider a very general class of mechanisms that we're going to call P. These are going to be our pricing mechanisms that are going to be formulated as follows. Right, it's going to be a distribution of the price I would like to post, where this distribution could change as a function of the history that would that I would have observed right so it's a collection of conditional distributions over all possible histories that I could have observed that's what we're going to try to optimize now again a very important special case of these is just what deterministic price would we like to post but but you're going to see that randomization can also help to improve performance and and this would allow us to really isolate the true value of data right but at the high level I've observed some history and we'd like to optimize, given the history I observe, how should I price? So Omar, a clairvoyant would actually fit, uh, fit a price one value. Absolutely. A clairvoyant would just pick one price. I'm going to come to the clairvoyant in a moment, but would just pick one price, which is the best price given the distribution F with knowledge of F. One more question. Yes. Uh, do we observe the characteristics of the buyer? So we don't observe the characteristics. So here we're going to assume that all buyers have their value that is distribution that is distributed according to F. Right? So no we're not heterogeneity then. So no, no, there is heterogeneity given the distribution F. So values could value them differently, but there's not no systematic that I could value that I could incorporate. But not systematically tied to characteristics, et cetera. It's just random. Yes, absolutely, exactly, right? So this is not gonna be a contextual price setting, right? Essentially, we're not observing side informations about the customers. Our only knowledge about the customers that are all of them have a value that is drawn from an unknown distribution, which is similar, which is the same for all, all, all buyers, yeah? Right, other clarifying questions are, Sorry, and the buyer buys the first time and his willingness to pay is greater than the price or okay, it's right, myopic? Right. Is, yeah, so this is not a repeated setting, right? This is a static. Program. It's a one shot. I have observed data and the next customer comes. How should I price? I see. Right, so there's no interaction with a customer. It's a one-time interaction and it's a take it or leave it offer essentially. Right for that customer. Yeah. Can I ask uh, the, the the incentive to randomize is only related to further learning? No, the incentive to randomize here we'll see later is related to actually hedging against possible underlying distributions, different possible distributions that could emerge, right? Because here we're not going to account for learning essentially because it's a one-shot game. So there's no value in future information, but I'm gonna comment later on how we could do so as well. But in the results I'm gonna to present today, we're just gonna try to understand how valuable is the data, right? For today's decision. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're welcome. So any any other clarifications right here? Because actually it's you know it's important to to have the formulation clearly laid out so that we can also interpret the results that come out. Okay, so how are we gonna evaluate the performance of a mechanism side, right? So in general, so here, let's, let's parse this out one step at a time, right? So if I post the price P, the revenues that I would collect is P times the fraction of customers that have a value above the price P. Right, so this is the revenue that I collect given that I price P. But now with what probability I price P, this will depend on the mechanism that I pick, right? And this mechanism, Psi, will depend on the history that materializes, right? This, and now I'm gonna integrate, so this is the out of sample revenues, right, that I would get. And this is my decisions. And now I'm gonna look at my expectations over all possible histories that could materialize, right? I'm looking at the expected performance of a mechanism, right? And that's why I'm also integrating over all the histories that I could have seen, yeah? So this is my expected revenue if I use a mechanism Psi. Now, of course, I cannot optimize this because I don't know F, right? And the history, the distribution of the history is related to the underlying distribution of customer valuations F. So this is why, right, going back to Victor's point, I'm gonna compare my expected revenues compared to the full information benchmark that I'm gonna call opt of F, right? Which would be the best I could have achieved had I known the full distribution. Right? And in this case, one can show that actually the best thing is to pick a deterministic price, a single price, which is actually maximizes the expected revenue. Right? So now this ratio of revenues is always between zero and one. Right? And the closer to one it is, the better. So one way to interpret this ratio is that it's the essentially the value of information. It, it, essentially, if we're able, the value of the history data. Right? How fast can we convert, can we approach one as a function of the history that we have? So, oh, sorry, Amar. Um, yeah. You don't know capital H, right? I mean, the distribution on no. H. No, uh, but no. So, for example, if it's samples, you would know that it's actually the product distributions because these are IID observations from F. Okay. Right. Yes. So but, you'd know how it depends on F, but you wouldn't know H. But, but you, do, you, you don't need to price before you see H. You're pricing after you see uh, yes, the K. Absolutely. So H. my Psi depends on H. But you're, 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 you're measuring the performance before you see that. I, I'm measuring a, the expected because performance expected across all histories. Right? right. And the idea is that if I observe one value, I cannot. You know, I cannot measure my expectation given just that value, right? I want to just have an average performance over all possible values I could have observed. Right. Right. And, and essentially, so essentially this, when, when H, when the history is samples from the willingness to pay distribution, we're going to have guarantees in expectation. When H is a history that is, for example, a percentile, then we're going to have almost sure guarantees, if you'd like. But, but this way, maybe you're gonna come back to that or not, but so you, you decide whether you wanna go more in detail, but uh, uh, can we compare with what you said, like the asymptotic analysis before, because there it's really about all the information that you actually gathered while here you're, you're actually looking at an expected value of- No, no but, 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 but I'm adjusting to the information, right? So here uh, it's gonna be essentially, the difference is that it's gonna be an expected value as opposed to being close with high probability, right? But being close with high probability has a direct correspondence because you're evaluating the tail of the performance. Right. So you can directly get an implication of the right. expected value. I see. Okay. Right, so there is a, essentially not a one-to-one -one mapping, but a very close mapping between the two. Hmm. Yeah, but, but, but the point here is that, yeah, I mean, there's a question here, by the way, it's like, what is a good way of formulating the problem, right? Because I observe a history, 
I cannot guarantee that for every single history, including very rare histories, I would do well. Right? If I'm extremely unlucky and I observe a sample that is not representative at all, I'm not going to do well. But the thing is that that's going to happen with very low probabilities. Right? So, but I cannot guarantee that for every, suppose I observed three customers. I cannot guarantee for any values that I've observed about these three customers, I will do well. That, that there's no magic in some sense. Right, and, and I think that's an important distinction here that we're, we're gonna guarantee that we'll do well in expectation, right? Across all possible histories based on the distribution of the histories. Sorry, I still yes. have a question about this. Yeah. Um, so the history does not depend on our own actions. The history, no, so uh, it depends. We're going to look at two settings. When we look at transaction data, it will depend on our own actions. When we look at samples, it will not depend on our own actions. So if we integrate over the entire history and it also depends on our own action, so we also have to integrate over all our possible actions. In theory, yes, right? And in the setting that I'll present later, essentially what I'm going to look at is one fundamental setting of historical data with transaction data where you have only one price in the past. If yeah. you have only one price, the history will just be one percentile. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right? But it could also be multiple percentiles. Now, I'm not claiming that we can solve this problem for every possible his, uh, historical data structure, but I'm gonna show you that actually we can, you know, do significant progress for many fundamental historical data structures. Okay. This Thank will you. be by no means the final answer to these problems, but I think that uh, it, it's, a, it's a good starting point. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Great. Great. Yeah. So, so what are we going to do? So indeed, we don't know F, right, as we've highlighted. So we cannot evaluate this ratio either. So the way we're going to evaluate performance is that we're going to evaluate performance across all possible distributions in a particular subclass F, right? And ideally we would like to take the subclass F as broad as possible and try to understand what type of performance guarantees can we get as a function of the performance, as a function of the class script F we get, right? So the general problem that we have here is the following, right? So what we would like to do is to find a good mechanism where we're going to maximize over all possible earlier mechanisms that adapt to the history, but where nature can counter us by picking any possible distribution in a broad class script F, right? So we would like to maximize the worst case ratio that we can achieve, right? And in that sense, this would quantify the robust value of information. Yeah. So, so this is what we're gonna be focusing on, right? And I'm gonna make these two formulations much more concrete when we discuss about these different information structures, right? This is more of an abstract formulation that essentially can be seen as encompassing both types of quite different information structures as a matter of fact, yeah. So what classes of distribution are we gonna pick? So it's possible to show that actually, if you pick all distributions, right, there's no, essentially there's no magic and there's no, the, the, there's no way to guarantee more than you know, a, a positive fraction of the optimal benchmark as mark, independently of the data size here, right? But what we're gonna focus on is two of the most common subclasses of distributions that are, include most of the distributions that are typically estimated in practice and fitted, right? One such class of distribution is a so-called increasing failure rate or monotone hazard rate distributions Right? These include uniform, truncated normal, logistic, exponential, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We're not gonna assume that the distribution is exponential. We're just gonna assume that it has monotone hazard rate. Or we're not gonna assume that it's uniform, so it could be any of these. Right? And we're not gonna assume any assumptions also about the support. Right? Similarly, we're gonna focus on another subclass called regular distributions, 
which is essentially the class with increasing virtual values or you know another way to interpret these exact classes of functions that have concave revenue functions in the quantile space right this is a superset of the monotone hazard rate class and it includes in addition to the monotone hazard rate class distributions with heavier tail such as pareto log normal etc right in particular our analysis will not be specialized to regular distributions or monotone hazard rate distribution it will actually be a single analysis that can be just applied to one versus the other right so we're going to see both of these as being special cases of a so-called class of alpha strong regular distributions right so i'm not going to go into the details of this this is a class that has been introduced in different communities under different names lambda regular distributions alpha strong regular distributions rho concave distributions but the only thing that I want to say, a special case of these when alpha is equal to zero is actually the regular class. Alpha is equal to zero is the big class. Alpha is equal to one is the MHR class. And what distinguishes between monotone hazard rate and regular classes is the allowable tails within the classes, right? Regular distributions allow for heavier tails in the class, whereas monotone hazard rate allow only for light tails. So now, since we're part of the Center of Advanced Mathematical Studies, it's worth to, 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 to mention a few comments about the mathematical problems that essentially these problems induce, right? So here we've motivated this from practice, but these are actually also quite interesting and fascinating mathematical problems themselves, right? When you think about this object that we're trying to analyze, the seller is optimizing over an infinite dimensional space of pricing mechanisms. Nature, right, is optimizing over an infinite dimensional, that is non-convex space of distribution F, the space of regular distribution or IFR, non-convex, and it's our infinite dimension. Right, so essentially here we're looking at this problem. What I wanna highlight is that this object is not an object that I could code and approximate or brute in a brute force way, right? There's no way to analyze this object without really getting a structured understanding of how, you know, making some headway about the underlying structure of the problem itself, right? But this is indeed a quite rich class of mathematical problems uh, that this induces. Okay, so this is the problem formulation. Now, what I'm going to head to is these two fundamental information structures. First, transaction data through percentile data. Second, sample data through interviews of customers. Yeah. So any questions before I move there? So we assume that the distribution does not change over time, correct? Yeah, we assume that the distribution does not change over time. And as a matter of fact, that's a great point that you're bringing here because part of the motivation for this is that we're, we're assuming that indirectly, we wanna understand limited data sizes, partly because distributions might change over time. That's one of the motivations. So the relevant data might be limited. Yeah. Other questions are, no? Okay, so let us now go to the first setting which is that of transaction data. And here I'm gonna discuss, you know, I would say the, the first, but I would argue is the most fundamental case there, which is trying to understand what can we do if we have only observed one historical price, right? We, we look at only the relevant data in the past quarter. The firm has op offered only one price. Can anything be said when you observe only one price? Right, so suppose that I observe that 20% of the customers bought in the past quarter. Among those who came to the website, 20% of them bought. What can I do given this information? Right, so um, this is what we're gonna focus on. Right, so you have your historical data and what you observe there is a historical price W and essentially uh, an interval to which the conversion rate belongs, right? So you could think about this as a confidence interval for the conversion rate associated with one particular price, right? And given this information structure, 
we would like to decide what's the best price. Right, so going back to the earlier questions that emerge here, we're not looking at things in expectation. We're gonna look at actually guarantees that one can get independently of the underlying distribution that materializes. And these guarantees are essentially with probability one in this case, right? So now here for the focus of the talk, I'll just focus on the case where we know exactly the percentile, but you know, the paper shows how we can handle confidence intervals as well, but it will be simpler to parameterize things by only one number, which is the percentile that we observed. Yeah. So and this data structure is, you know, it's quite typical in practice. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, we encounter it with my colleague, Adam el uh, uh, and Yun Ji Sun a few years ago when we were working with a large OEM and they told us, oh, we need help in actually improving our de pricing decisions. And then they gave us the data and the price had never changed over the past year, right? Where do you go from there, right? So one can develop heuristics or, uh, and here, so essentially in there, you know, so this is really something I would argue that uh, is reasonably common, especially if you ask yourself, what is the relevant data that I want to use? Right, so now, um, so now what can be said here? So this is what we, we, we show in this, for, for these types of information structure. So what we derive is really a way to best exploit the available data, right? Given the data that we have, what's the best thing we can do? And we'll see that we can price actually reasonably well even with very limited data and even without derivatives and any elasticity estimation, right? And we develop actually a unified framework across distribution classes where we'll be able to characterize exactly the optimal performance of deterministic mechanisms, as a matter of fact, in closed form, but also characterize near exactly the optimal performance of randomized mechanisms through an appropriate sequence of linear programs where we can actually get near optimal mechanisms, but also the associated performance. But actually equally importantly, if not more importantly, we'll develop actually what I think actually are quite surprising and fundamental insights on the value of these percentile data. All right, so let us, let me give a brief overview of the types of results that one can obtain. And these are just some samples of results and then I'll highlight more of the theory afterwards. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is to look at the two classes, regular distributions and monotone hazard rate distributions. And for each of these classes, I'm gonna tell, suppose we had access to information where at my historical price, I observed 1% of the customers buying. Can I do anything given this? If I observe 25% of the customers buying, can I do anything given this? 50% the median, can I do anything? or 70%, 75% of the customers buying, what can I do given this, right? And we're gonna do this for both the regular distributions and MHR distributions. Again, to highlight, we're not assuming anything about any parametric structure about the true underlying distributions. We're only assuming that it either belongs to the regular class or to the MHR class. So what are the types of results that one can say here? Let us start with the median, for example. Right, if I've only observed that half of the customers bought in the past at my historical price, what can I do? Matter of fact, we show that actually with randomized mechanisms, just based on one point on the entire demand curve, you can already guarantee more than 56% of the best performance you would have achieved had you known the entire curve. Right, so one point on that curve leads to 60% of the value associated with the entire curve, right? Just the median. Now, what if you observe something else, right? Again, here we're developing an optimal decision as a function of the data we have, right? So if you observe that 75% of the customer's bought, you can still do something, even though, you know, your price is most likely too low, you can still guarantee more than 41% of the best performance you could have hoped for with the entire curve. If you observe that 25% of the customers bought, you can guarantee more than 67%, more than two thirds of the value associated with knowing the entire curve, right? Can you say anything with 1%? Yes, you can actually, you can guarantee almost a third 
of the value associated with the entire curve, just one percent of the customer, that small percentage of customers is extremely informative. Right, and the regular class of distribution is quite broad and includes in particular heavy tail distributions. Now, if we exclude those heavy tails and we focus on monotone hazard rate distribution that include most of, many of the commonly estimated models that tend to have lighter tails, the results are even more striking. If you observe the median, you can guarantee more than 85% of the best performance you could have achieved had you known the entire curve. Just the median allows you to price essentially at that level. If you observe just 1%, you're still able to guarantee more than 51% of the best performance you could have achieved. That small percentage of customers gives you half of the, the total value you can derive from knowing the entire curve. Right, so this is in that sense that I think that these reveal actually quite interesting and novel insights about the value of the actual historical data we already have, even if it's very limited. Omar, um, yep. when you say monotone has a rate, you mean increasing or also decreasing? No, no, only increasing. Only increasing, okay. Um, do you know these numbers for any conversion rate? Could you make like a graph? Absolutely, that graph is coming next. Oh, Thanks sorry, sorry. <laughs> with me, I appreciate it. <laughs> yes. So, so first, I'm going to highlight how we obtain these. But here, what we have is indeed a mapping from any conversion rate to an optimal performance, but also to a, a way of achieving that performance to the optimal mechanism. Yeah. Right, so, so how do we uh, you know, derive these results? And uh, at a high level, as I said, this class of problems is quite rich. As a matter of fact, we can reformulate the object we're trying to analyze as a mathematical program, which could be viewed as an infinite dimensional linear program. Right, and uh, the key step I'll tell you that uh, allowed to make significant progress here is to really identify the notion of redundant constraints in this infinite dimensional linear program to reduce the number of constraints from you know constraints that are essentially parameterized by the class to constraints that are parameterized by just a single dimension right just a single parameters right so we are moving from a very broad set of candidate worst cases to only a one dimensional set of candidate worst cases Right, and this allows two things. One, first to analyze deterministic mechanisms where we can actually isolate three types of regimes that are associated with where the conversion rate would fall. And actually we can obtain closed form solutions for the optimal value, but also the optimal mechanisms for deterministic mechanisms. For randomized mechanism, this reduces to a set, we can introduce a reduction to a set of discrete mechanisms and quantify the loss that we get from there and we can also reduce further the number of constraints from infinite to a finite one and control the error introduced there. This allows us to approximate arbitrarily closely that value of the minimum max min ratio through a sequence of linear problems. And we can upper bound and lower bound that value and quantify the suboptimality gap, right? So now let me highlight examples of such uh, results first through the deterministic mechanisms and highlight the curves that were referred to earlier. Right, so the problem that we formulated initially, one could reformulate it as a mathematical program in this way, where we're trying to maximize the best guarantee that I can get subject to the constraint that the expected revenue of my mechanism exceeds that guarantee times the Oracle revenues. And we need this constraint to hold for all distributions F in the subclass F alpha, which I parameterize here by the historical price and the um, quanta, right? The, the percentile that we've observed, right? And here Psi, just for shortage of notation, I'm just including Psi of P, but really this depends on Q as well, right? My parameter Psi depends on Q my uh, pricing mechanism. Now, the first reduction that, yes, question? Sorry, 
yeah the, the class p prime script uh, p prime is is what very good so essentially it's any subclass of mechanisms that, thank you for this comment right so what i want to highlight here why did i change from p to p prime is to highlight that fix any subclass of mechanism for example deterministic or randomized there is the reduction that we're going to present holds so for any subclass of mechanism what one can show is that the max min ratio against the entire class of distribution which could be regular or mhr is equal to the max min ratio against the subclass of distribution which is essentially a one dimension you know a class of distribution parameterized by a single parameter right so we can go from the entire space to a much smaller subset of distribution that is parameterized by a single parameter and this parameter to essentially allows us to look at classes essentially of translated and truncated general Pareto distributions generalized Pareto distributions right so this is really a fundamental reduction that goes from a huge class of possible distributions to a subset that tells us these are the constraints that are going to bind here yeah so now with this essentially we can go and apply it to the class p prime of deterministic mechanisms or to the class p prime of randomized mechanisms yeah. Right. So, so let us look at what happens uh, with uh, deterministic mechanisms first. Right. So, for deterministic mechanisms, so here I'm going to call this PD D for deterministic, and I'm going to highlight the results we get for regular distributions with the understanding that we get parallel results for MHR distributions. Right. So, what we have is two types of results. One is what is the prescription. How should we price given the history that we got? Right? And we see three regimes that emerge here as a function of the value of Q, the percentile that we observe. Right? If the fraction of customers that we observed is actually greater than a half of the customers that bought at the historical price, essentially you could you should keep your price at the same level. That's the prescription, the deterministic prescription. Right, so here I'm plot. I'm showing the normalized price, the optimal price given my historical data, normalized by the historical price. Yeah. So if, however, the historical percentile is between a fourth and a half, we should do something different. And similarly, if we are between zero and a fourth, we should do something different. We can do things in closed form here, and I'm going to highlight actually that this closed form are fairly revealing later. Right? But we can also quantify the optimal performance in closed form as a function of these three regimes, and it's given by this. Right? So again, the important thing takeaway here is that this allows us to start understanding this robust value of even limited data, and actually in a very transparent fashion. Now I'm going to show the graphs that were referred to earlier, which would allow us to visualize how do we price, but also the performance that we can achieve across all values of Q, right? And this will be actually more revealing than the formulas themselves, right? So the optimal price with a single percentile, again, as we saw earlier for regular distributions in blue, if the percentile was greater than a half, we price at the same historical level, which here I take one just by convention. And then, however, we start to observe a percentile that's lower than that, we need to deflate our historical price. We need to decrease our price and here we have a prescription for by how much would you like to decrease your historical price as a function of the percentile that you've observed. And similarly for MHR distribution, the behavior is, is different, right? Because there's different tail behavior. Now there are fewer heavy tails that are allowed. There are no heavy tails allowed here, right? But let us look at the percentage. So this is what we should do, but what does it lead to, right? And this is the graph. I promised earlier, this is the max min ratio in percentage on the y-axis as a function of the value Q. For regular distribution, you can do this for any value of Q, right? So in particular, we observe that the most informative percentile is actually 25% here, which leads to about 65% of performance. But we also see that actually across a broad range of quantiles, this information structure is extremely valuable. Right, let's just look at MHR distribution. Uh, so actually, based on the formulas, actually you can also understand how does this behave on these two sides? 
which is interesting, actually, the behavior around zero is supralinear, right? So the derivative around zero is actually infinite. And as a matter of fact, you can show that it increases around zero like square root of Q. And we saw it from the formulas earlier, right? It is here, right? So this is, and this is actually quite interesting. Actually, this highlights that small percentiles are extremely valuable, right? And we see it from the map. Right? And essentially, why are small percentiles extremely valuable? Because they give information about the tail. Excuse me. Right? Yeah, Ozan? Yeah. Uh, in the previous uh, slide, if I may ask, so does this mean that, the let's take the uh, regular case. Yeah. Does it mean that as long as at least 50% or so of the customers have purchased, then do not reduce your price? Is that what it's yes, telling me? Yes, that's the interpretation of this graph. And if, there is no... Let me just finalize the answer. If you restrict yourself to deterministic prices, we're going to see that the answer changes if you allow yourself to randomize prices. And there is no case of in, in, recommending an increase in the price, even though everybody bought it. B very good. So that's a great point. So here, why is there no, this is a great question, actually. So here, indirectly, we're looking at the robust value of information. Now, increasing your price is a very risky strategy because you, you have to hedge against all possible distribution. Suppose you increase your price by 10%, nature could put a mass at the historical price, and then you would generate zero, right? But now, what we're going to see is that if you allow yourself to randomize, you can actually hedge against these scenarios as well. And you can increase your price only probabilistically. And that's gonna help you quite a bit. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. Yes, thank you. All right, so, so now for MHR distribution, look at this curve. I mean, across Q values between 0 0.1 and 0 0.7, we are above 60% of value. I mean, to me, the, what was striking is the y-axis, the magnitude of the y-axis. How quickly do we get to high performance based on a single point in our historical data, a single historical price? Look at how slowly does it go to zero around Q is equal to zero. As a matter of fact, we can quantify this. It goes to zero at the lowest possible rate you could imagine, order log of one over Q minus one, right? For a while, you know, I think Ashraf is here, we wondered, right? So is this converging to zero? Because it was very hard to see this convergence to zero. You know, still with 1%, you're still getting actually more than 50% of the maximal value you could hope with the knowledge of the full curve. Now, what happens with randomization, right? So with randomization, we can discretize the mechanisms on a discrete grid that is properly picked. I'm not gonna go through the details of these given the time constraints, but, and we can leverage monotonicity to actually derive an approximation to this earlier program that we have over only the subclass, not the entire class, because now we have reduced the number of constraints to obtain a linear program that always yields a lower bound on the max min ratio, All right? So we're able to approach essentially from below this max min ratio. Not only it leads to lower bound, we can show that it converges to the, uh, the value of this LP converges to the max min ratio as we increase the discretization, right? So in particular, what can we show is that the max min value is lower bounded by this linear program and upper bounded by a correction of order one over square root of N, N parameterizes the discretization, the number of points in the discretization plus the value of the linear program. So the point that the main takeaway from here is that we can obtain very quickly, provably near optimal randomized mechanisms. And second, we can exactly value, quantify the value of information. This is the maximum value I can hope when now I don't tie my hands anymore through deterministic mechanism, but I allow myself also to have randomized mechanisms. Right, and let us see the impact of that. So maybe I'm not gonna go through the, the prescription. Let me just go directly through the, um, so through the uh, impact of randomization, right? So here I have the two curves for regular and random, uh, uh, deterministic is the bottom one, the, the whatever the, 
the squares there and the circles are the uh, randomized. And see, you see the gap between the two is the value of randomization, right? Which is quite significant, right? You see here at a quantile of 80%, actually you're getting more than 20% of boost in performance because of randomization, right? As a matter of fact, randomization affects the economics of the value of data here in a significant way. We can quantify it exactly at those extremes. Here we had a linear decay of the ratio as Q went to one, right? This was in part due to what Ozen mentioned earlier. We weren't able to increase our price when we, we felt that we should try to increase our price. Now, because of randomization, we can affect this to go again at one of the slowest rates you could imagine, one over log of one minus, uh, one over one minus Q. Similarly, around zero, we go from a rate of square root of Q, which was supralinear to a rate of, again, one over log of one minus Q, again, an extremely slow rate, right? And similarly for MHR distributions, randomization helps a lot, especially when you have high quantiles. And now just because I was asked earlier, let me show you just examples of policies here. So this is a policy for regular distributions with a Q of 0 0.75, the black line. Now the black line, what happens with randomization? The best randomized policy puts a lot of mass at the existing price. Actually, it puts half of the mass at the existing price. Here I'm plotting psi of P, which is the CDF of the prices I want to post. So it puts half of the price at the historical uh, half of the mass at the historical price, and the rest of the mass is spread between one and a hundred. Right here I have a log scale on the x-axis. Right? So it essentially allows you to increase your price probabilistically. Right? And this allows you to hedge against these scenarios where there would be a mass you know, exactly at the historical price or right after that. Right? And this is what gives you this boost in performance here. Okay, so now um, let me just summarize a few fundamental insights that, that we get from here. Right? So in percentiles, provide one percentile provides very little information about the distribution of values. It's just one point, but really the value of information should depend on what you use this information for. What we've shown here is that if you're using it for pricing purposes, that information can be extremely valuable, right? Not only that different types of percentiles need different type of value. And what we've discovered here is that actually small percentiles need yield what I think is quite surprisingly, actually very high pricing information content. It's low information content in absolute, but it's very high pricing information content. And finally, randomization can yield actually quite significant performance improvements in this class of problems. So maybe I'll pause here for a second to see if there are any questions hanging before I move to the next part, which discusses these other types of information structures. So Omar, question. <laughs> um, suppose you use that uh, prescription on a, on a, you know, sequentially. Yeah. Right? What you're telling me is that this is a good one for the next customer, right? So now, you know, let's kind of like use it in a multi-arm bandit kind of setting, right? So every time, and every time is a new history. And so I have another prescription based on, you know, kind of what you're saying, right? So yeah. it kind of also should tell me how good, because clearly the result depend on the, on the performance that you defined, right? Yeah. Um, does it make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. And, and in some sense that you could view this and actually hopefully Ashraf will be able to present some results soon, but indeed, so you could view it as a way to warm start an algorithm a dynamic learning algorithm, right? So in some sense, very often we say, okay, as long as we don't have enough price dispersion, there's little that can be said. This says, no, actually, even if you don't have price dispersion, there's a good way to price. Even in the initial transient phase where you're collecting different prices, there are many different ways through which you can collect relevant information. This tells you that there's a systematic way that would work independently whether Actually, that would work well independently whether your underlying distribution is uniform, exponential, or anything of that sort. 
So you could view it as a way to warm start the algorithm, but also to optimize the sequence of prices that would do well with limited data on the way to getting to the asymptotics, but would also do well down the road by doing the proper price dispersion, right? And uh, so, so indeed, I mean, like essentially this framework can also be used to start understanding sequential experimentation in pricing, mm -hmm. right? What is the best sequence of experiments that I would like to do and whether I care about the final performance or the performance on the way would affect a little bit which prices I would pick. Hmm. Right, but, but, but in some sense here, what this would allow to do is to understand what's the value of a f one experiment, two experiments, three. Right, right. right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I think Aiden I has a question. Sorry, Aiden, yeah, hey. Hi, hi Mark. Uh, great talk, good to see you too. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm wondering if there's anything to be gained by knowing the type of distribution, like uh, a company might actually do some, a bit of market research, at least to understand if it's, if it's extreme value, if it's exponential, if it's normal. And, uh, and based on that, maybe, I mean, your, your theory is quite general, right? So there's a huge class of distributions, right? So if I know at least uh, the type of distribution, would I gain anything? From that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question, and, and in some sense, um, so in some sense, what the, here what this reveals as well is what are the hard cases within this broad class, mm -hmm. and what are the extreme cases. And in some sense, the hard cases are, for example, for increasing failure rate distributions, focusing on those. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a type of sub. It's a family of translated and truncated exponential distributions. So you know that exponentials are actually some of the hardest functions within IFR. But for example, so, so essentially, if you reduce to exponential, we wouldn't necessarily gain. But if we said we knew that it would be uniform, we just don't know the support, we could do significantly better, right? Uh, uh, so, so definitely uh, there's, and similarly, like here, I'm presenting the result based on knowing one percentile, but also suppose that you say, okay, I know that no customer buys above $100. Now that's knowledge about the support. I could add this information and do even better. Right, so in some sense, this could be viewed as the lower bound on what you can do mm -hmm. as you start doing that. And, and the bottom line is that the lower bound is already very high. So, yes, I, I, right, so, 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 but yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. so definitely one could uh, improve that by looking at subclasses of distribution. And I would expect that, you know, there are, there are a few subclasses that could be tractable. For example, uniform would be, and, uh, and maybe others, yeah. And, and you haven't looked at them formally. Sorry? No. We haven't looked at them for no. no, 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 no. no. Okay, great. Hopefully uh, you and others will, will do that and uh, we'll learn more. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Good. I just wanted to add that we have looked at the case where we add an information about the support of the distribution and we do know how to incorporate that information into the price recommendation as well as yeah. the value yeah. of that information too. But we haven't looked at like parametric classes yet. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ashraf. So yeah, so now again, we don't have a lot of time left, but so what I would try to do is just to give a very high level highlight about what you can do with this other type of information structure, which is pricing with samples. Here, the historical data is not essentially transaction data, but it's just interviews. I interviewed Aiden, he told me he valued, so S1 means that I interviewed only one customer when N is equal to one. When n is equal to two, I interview two customers, et cetera, et cetera. And what we would like to understand is how can I price as a function of the number of samples that I've collected, right? And as I mentioned earlier, right, essentially outside of two points here that I'm gonna highlight in a moment, very little is known with regard to how fast this information accumulates, right? And uh, so, so again, Maybe rather than going through, through this, given the time constraints, I'm, I want to go to the type of results that we show. And uh, so when you have a single sample, so when you observe a single sample, right? So what was known before this worry that for regular distributions, actually one could show that the best, they exist an algorithm that can go from that sample, transform it, and price in a way that guarantees in expectation more than 50% plus five times 10 to the power minus nine, right? And the point here, again, was that 
that this paper made, it's actually a very interesting paper. It made that, look, you can do better than 50%. 50% was the best that you could do with deterministic mechanisms. The idea here is that if you expand to randomized mechanisms, you can potentially do better. And they were able to show that there was a separation between randomized mechanisms and deterministic mechanisms. All right, so what do we show in this work is that actually you can do, you can do better. You can do 50.2%. But actually, equally importantly, we also show that you cannot do more than 51.1%. Right, so the value associated with one sample, one sample for pricing purposes with regular distributions is between 50.2% and 51.1%. Right, now for MHR distribution, what was known is that the best algorithm, the best performance that was known before was 58%, 0.9%. We showed that actually can do much better. You can be at 64.4%, which just one sample already allows you to achieve almost two thirds of the value associated with the entire distribution. I just spoke to Victor and that's it. And I can guarantee more than 64% of performance. Right? And actually this is essentially the best that you can hope for for any algorithm that you would pick. Right? So this nailed down the exact value associated with one sample uh, across distributions. And our theory applies across all alpha strongly regular distributions. Now, when you have more than one sample, essentially there's essentially no known distribution, no known results except one for n is equal to two for regular distributions that said that for regular distributions, you can achieve at least 55.8% with two samples, right? But there's no improvement to that as you increase the number of samples. So essentially the best performance note to date was 55.8 or asymptotics, right? And, uh, and so what do we show, right? So Mark, we show, yes, Marco? Could you give us an intuition of why to do M equal to or more is so difficult with respect to N equal one? Very good. So <laughs> no, first of all, let me highlight that n is equal to one is very difficult okay. <laughs> or was very difficult, at least for us. I mean, maybe it couldn't be for others, but uh, so, but now what's challenging with, uh, so what, what's the big gap from n is equal to one to two, to, to more? And uh, in particular, what's difficult in n is equal to one is the impossibility results, right? How can we ensure that essentially there's an impossibility across all algorithms, you can say the maximum that you can do. But the big difference between n is equal to one to two is the fact that with n or, or more is that n is equal to one, we can reparameterize pricing mechanisms by a single distribution over essentially one of our results is that we can show that you can restrict attention to mechanisms that are distributions over a multiplicative factor of the sample, right? So essentially we are optimizing over a single distribution. That is a significant reduction, not only in the space of distribution, but also in the space of mechanisms. As soon as you go to more, the reduction in the space of mechanisms is not clear. And that's the key, essentially, I would say separating hyperplane between these cases. And now suddenly there's a question, that's a great segue because there's a question when you have more than more samples, there's a question, which policy would you use? Right, it's not clear. So one natural policy to use is sample average approximation. Right, which is known to be good asymptotically. And as a matter of fact, this guarantee comes from sample average approximation, right? Where you're just taking a distribution that is based on the historical samples and pick the best price. Again, but you know, this is one candidate policy. Maybe there are other policies, right? And uh, what we show is that actually you can do much better by doing, you can do better by taking other policies, right? So. What do we show? For n is equal to two, we can improve actually significantly the guarantees for regular from 55 to 61.5. And that in particular involves changing the policy that we use. So we introduce a different subclass of policies that actually seems to be more suited for small sample regimes. And we can show that you can take this up to 65% with 10 samples. Now with MHR distributions, with two samples, you can already get 71% of performance. So now I had interviewed Victor earlier and I got 64%. Now I interview Marco and I get 71% of guarantee in performance in expectation, right? If I interview 10 people, then I get more than 
as a guarantee in performance. Right, so this shows that information accumulates very fast as you gather more and more samples from a pricing perspective. Right, so, so this allows us to understand, I mean, how fast such information accumulates. And the performance results here, again, there's no upper bound here, going back to Marco's question, these are just achievability results. As soon as we go from n is equal to one to two, in n equals one, we had optimality statements. Now we have achievability statements, right? So there's a question of whether one can improve these and what are upper bounds or impossibility results here, right? So now, you know, just let me highlight the fundamental insights that, that we get from here. Right, a few samples can go a very long way in pricing, even though they reveal not too much information about the entire distribution, they reveal a lot of pricing information content. Right, and also operating with finite samples requires potentially a different type of policies. Actually, the policies that we introduced to achieve the earlier performance are you know, some form of robust pricing statistics that are appropriately scaled. Right, that are inspired. Essentially, the analysis that we did for one sample allowed us to allow to inspire some candidate policies for multiple samples. Right, and here this you know provides or opens up the possibility of a principled approach for non-asymptotic understanding of how fast information accumulate in pricing problems. So, let me just highlight this picture here to highlight how did we approach this problem. And this goes, we'll go back to Marco's questions before concluding and opening up for questions, right? So, so here in the one sample case, a key reduction was that we were able to reduce the space of possible mechanisms to a single distribution, as opposed to a distribution that depends on the sample that you observe, right? So now we're optimizing only on one distribution. Now this led to inspire the set of candidate space of mechanisms with n samples. Now we could look at a single multiplicative distributions over, not, now it's not that we have one sample, but over statistics of the samples that we have observed, right? And this led to a systematic analysis of multiplicative order statistics mechanisms, right? And those we show that actually we can handle quite well and develop lower bounds and upper bounds that are nearly tight for these, right? And the approach here is actually quite, you know, involved in terms of understanding these because what is difficult when we are looking at these problems is that this goes back to the point I mentioned earlier, we're not looking at just small pricing mistakes. Here, we could have large pricing mistakes, but we need to quantify the implications of these. These large pricing mistakes are gonna happen with some probabilities. We might see some outliers. I need to account for the probability of that happening in conjunction with the implication of these mistakes. So here we're looking at the, all the out of sample costs associated with our policy, the expected out of sample costs associated with our policies. Yeah. So, and then we are able also to develop upper bounds through a proper reduction in the space of distributions as well. Right. So now let me maybe, I, I, I've been a bit optimistic on what I could show. So let me move to the conclusions here. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and then open it up for questions, right? So what are some high level takeaways and uh, future questions that indeed uh, emerge from here? So, right, what we've tried to do here is to try to develop a general framework for finite or limited data regimes and trying to understand how information accumulates as we gather more data. We've looked at two, what I would argue are fairly prototypical and foundation, foundational information structures samples from the willingness to pay distributions where there's no interaction between the decisions and the data we collect and transaction data which are come in the form of percentiles right and for these two types of information structures what we have done is quantified really the robust value of data that we have including for small sample sizes and this gives the possibility of starting to think at a, of a bottom-up approach to data-driven pricing and this also you know opens actually various how are you novel methodologies as we are trying to quantify these big pricing mistakes uh, in addition to the small ones we may do with a lot of data, right? There are many new questions that this opens up. First of all, now we have a good understanding of you know, large samples. We have a 
you know, we're starting to have a much better understanding of what happens with a few samples. And we see that we need different policies in both. So there's a question of what's a good policy that interpolates between what we should do as we get more samples and what we should do when we have few samples. And can we, you know, quantify the entire curve associated and link essentially the asymptotic regime with the low sample regimes? There's a question also of how to encode additional information about the unknown distribution. Ashraf has already made quite a bit of progress on that, and he mentioned some examples on these. And this opens up also these questions of how can you use this in sequential problems where we're trying to, for example, optimize experimentation as we go forward. And we've seen that we can potentially optimize the sequence of experiments in a refined way, given this frame. Right. On this, I'll conclude here, and I'll be very happy to open it up for questions if there are additional questions. Very dense, indeed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, any question we still have, you know, we can have a uh, one maybe for... Uh... It's all clear. <laughs> <laughs> I think, okay, <laughs> let me maybe step back. I think if there's one thing I'd like us to all take away from here is that actually your data has a lot of value from a pricing perspective. That's one. There's hope to quantify the value of limited data sets, right? And I think these two are the general takeaways. And then, right, if you'd like to see how to do it in more detail, right, I invite you to go and read these two papers, right, uh, with Ashraf and Amin that uh, highlight, uh, you know, the, how we can do that. So, Omar, you're starting a new trend as opposed to big data. Actually, it's small data. Uh, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Omar. Uh, we're going to uh, stop here. I ju just want to really, it's, uh, it was a uh, very enlightening. Uh, and thanks a lot. Uh, just want to tell the audience that uh, the next theme is going to start on November 30th. The theme is on choice modeling and Hossein Topaloglu from Cornell and Gustavo Volcano from Ditella will be actually uh, the two researchers leading that effort from a short course point of view and a seminar as well uh, through two weeks, exactly the same uh, structure we followed in our first theme. So thanks again. Thanks a lot, Omar. Really. Um, Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you soon in person. Thanks. Have a good one, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Omar. Thanks, Marco. Good to see you. Good to see you. Let's catch up.